number 64. <clears throat> the formula A equals 268 times E to the power 0 0.04 times T models the population of a particular city in thousands and T is the number of years after 1998. So the first question is saying when will the population reach 315,000? So when will A equals 315,000? So 315 is equals to 268 times E to the power 0 0.04 times T. So we're solving for T pretty much, right? We're looking for the amount of time that it will take that population to reach 315,000. So we can begin by dividing both sides by 268. So we have 315 divided by 268 is equal to e to the power 0 0.04 times t. Then I'm going to apply the natural logarithm on both sides. And then make use of the power property to bring the power to the front. And then I will have ln of 315 divided by 268. And if you remember, um, ln of e just becomes a 1. So we're left with 0.04t. And then next will divide by 0 0.04 and we are left with ln of 315 over 268 divided by 0 0.04 and that equals to the amount of years um, that it'll take the population to reach 315,000 so take a moment to plug that into the calculator and see what you get. And we get t equals to 4. So it will have to be 4 years after 1998 until the population reaches 315,000. So the year will be 2002 when the population will reach that number. So 2002 will be the answer. Although t, t equals four was what, I, what we found, it is not considered the final answer, okay? Uh, then we're asked, what was the population of the city in 1998? So once again, we get A is equal to 268, e to the power 0 0.04 times t. Well, you can look at it several ways. You can say t equals 0 was 1998. Therefore, if you plug in t equals to 0, you'll get the initial population, which is 268 thousand or 
you can just look at the original problem and see the number that is being multiplied to the e, right? So make the connection that this is the formula we're using a equals a sub 0 times e to the power k times t. Well, a sub 0 is the initial amount or population in this case. Okay, and then for two reasons, right, we've shown that 268,000 is the initial population in 1998. Okay, but only because 1998 is the, the year where the population started being counted. Okay, number or letter C, part C of the problem, is the population increasing or decreasing? So if we look at the function, a equals 268,000 times E, um, let's say, A is equal to 268,000 times E to the power 0 .4, 0 0.04 times T. Um, K is the growth or decay rate. So we look at the value of k in this problem is 0 0.04. We see that it's positive. And so since it's positive, the population is growing. Okay. So if the k value is positive, then growing. And if it's negative, it means decaying. Okay. Number 68. <clears throat> the value of a particular investment follows a pattern of exponential growth. In a year, or in the year 2000, you invested money in a money market account. The value of your investment T years after 2000 is given by the exponential growth model. A is equal to 6600 times E raised to the power 0 0.047 times T. When will the account be worth $9,171? Same as before. Um, 9,171 is the value of A. So 9,171 is equal to 6,600 E to the power 0 0.047 times T. And we're solving for the time, right? So solve for T. Um, and then we'll say which year will that happen so divide both sides by 6600 so we have 9171 divided by 6600 equal to 0 0.047 t apply ln on both sides make use of the power property, bring the power to the front. And then realize that we have ln of E once again, so we don't have to write it again. So we have 0 0.047 times t. And then we're going to divide both sides by that decimal. OK. Plug that into the calculator, and let's see what we get. A 
and we get t to be equal to 6.9995, of course, roughly, that is 7 years. Um, thus, in the year 2007 is when the investment will be worth $9,171 exactly. Okay, so same problem as before. We get t equals to a number, but we have to use the information on the body of the problem to finalize that solution. Okay, <clears throat> number 68, a leaf fossilized contains 12% of its normal amount of carbon-14. How old is the fossil to the nearest year? Um, use 5,600 years as the half-life of carbon-14. So, two-step problem. Um, step number one, find the value of k, right? And the equation we're using is a equals to a sub zero, e to the power k t. If you remember, um, you can solve for k and t, right? So a is equal to a sub zero, e to the power k t. So if I divide by a sub zero, I have e to the power k t, right? So step one of solving for k or t. Then I'm going to apply ln Then I'm going to bring the power out to the front on the right side of the equal sign and notice that ln of e goes away so here I can have two definitions pretty much I have ln of a divided by a sub 0 divided by k is equals to t or ln of a over a sub 0 equals to t over t I'm sorry is equals to k so uh, that was just the work to show you how to solve for k or t uh, in step one, like I said, we're solving for k. I'm going to erase all of this and use that definition to find the value of k with the given information. So, knowing that 5600 is the half-life, of the carbon, I'm going to do the following. So k is equal to ln of one half over the amount of time that it takes for that to be half of the amount. Okay, so plug that into the calculator and we'll get the value of k. So we get something like 0 0.000124 as our value of k and negative. Keep in mind that it is negative. So that is the first step is to find the value of k. <clears throat> then we can figure out part two which will be to find the 12% or no, actually how old it is if there's only 12% left. So use the idea that the final amount is 12% of the original. So 12% times the original 
equals to the final amount. Okay, so we use that information to plug it into the the formula or the worked out value for t. So t is equal to ln of a over a sub zero divided by k. Well, ln of what did we say a was? It was 12% of the original. So 0 0.12 times a sub zero divided by a sub zero. And then we're going to plug in the value of k. So negative 0 0.00024 then ln of the value of a sub zero, um, the variable name cancels out because it's both in the numerator and the denominator of that natural logarithm. So we get this. So plug that into the calculator. And we get something like 17,100, uh, we could even say, well, 130. So that leaf that's been fossilized is 17,130 years. Okay. Now we're moving into logistic growth and decay. So let's look at the following. <clears throat> the logistic growth function f of t describes the population of a species of butterflies uh, t months after they are introduced to a non-threatening habitat. How many butterflies were initially introduced to the habitat. So pretty much they're asking at time equals zero, how many of the butterflies So all we have to do is f evaluated at zero is equal to 320 over 1 plus 2 times 2.6 times e to the power negative 0 0.0 negative 0 0.13 times zero, right? So 320 divided by 1 plus 2.6 pretty much because e to the 0 just becomes a 1. So we get something like 88.8. So 89 butterflies were present at time 0, which is what we're looking for right at the at the very beginning of the experiment or whenever they started gathering the data how many butterflies were there and t equals zero gives us 89 butterflies number 70 <clears throat> um, logistic growth function again describing uh, the species of the population of a species of butterfly t months after they're introduced to a non-threatening habitat. How many butterflies are expected in the habitat after 19 months? So we're looking for the function f evaluated at the value 19. So 440 
divided by 1 plus 5.3 e to the power negative 0 0.16 times 19. All right, so 440 divided by 1 plus uh, 5.3 times e to the power negative 0 0.16 times 19. Make sure you type in all the correct numbers <clears throat> so you don't make a mistake. And 351 butterflies are present at month 19. Okay? So, same idea as before, you just evaluated the function at a different month. Okay. Number 71, the logistic growth models the number of people who have become ill with a particular infection T weeks after its initial outbreak in a particular community. So notice this equation measures time in terms of weeks. What is the limiting size of the population that becomes ill? <clears throat> so what is the population left over or the population has been infected after time pretty much goes to infinity so what it's saying is after a lot of time has passed what will the population or what will the number be so what you can do is pick a very large number for t 10,000 20,000 right after 20,000 weeks or something like that what's going to happen is that the value in the denominator since it's a negative exponent e to the power negative 1.5 is going to go to zero okay and that's going to become very small. Well, the, the whole thing will go to zero. And you're pretty much going to be left with the number above, or 43,000. Okay, so we can check that by dividing 43,000 over 1 plus 8.59 times e to the negative power 1.5 times 20,000 or something, right? And so we can verify that on a calculator. Okay. And any any big number that you pick for time will eventually give you the same value, which is 43,000. So the idea behind the limiting factor is if you have a population of 43,000 people and you allow everybody to get sick, how many people can get sick? Well, everyone. So 43,000 people will eventually become ill. Okay? So that's the idea behind the limiting factor. Okay? Uh, at this point, we're getting into the probability and other things so we're trying to evaluate the expression and if you remember the symbol next to the 8 is called the factorial so let's really quick remember what is the definition of factorial and it is simply the product of the number that you're given times every number before it all the way down 
to 1. So the product of all the numbers from 8 all the way down to 1. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 and so on. Okay, so 8 factorial give us something like 40,320. Okay, so well, it's something very useful. Okay, so be sure to know where to find it in your calculator or at least know the definition for it. Okay, next we're given this expression, <clears throat> and so we have to know that it can either be understood as the binomial coefficient or uh, it's another notation for a combination, right? It just says 6, choose 3. And its formula, right, is the following. So 6 factorial over 3 factorial times 6 minus 3, and all of that factorial, right? So be sure to know how to plug it in into the calculator if needed, or if you just want to make use of the definition like we have here, then be sure to know where the factorial is and all that. So, definitely. So 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 all over 3 times 2 times 1 times 3 times 2 times 1. So <clears throat> perhaps I'll label where this work has come from. So 6 factorial is that product. 3 factorial is right here, and by coincidence, we have another 3 factorial right here, right, because 6 minus 3 is 3, and then the factorial that's being evaluated there. So we can cancel the product, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, and then 3 times 2 becomes 6, and it can cancel with that 6, so that is why the reason the answer is 20. Okay, so 6, choose 3. And you can also view it as, out of 6 options, how many different ways can you choose 3 items? And the answer is 20 different ways. Alright, <clears throat> next. Use the binomial theorem to expand the binomial and express the result in a simplified form. So. Let's do it. We have 4 choose 0 and x squared to the power 4 times negative 4y to the power 0. That is the first term. And everything from there will just be separated by some addition of it. Then it goes up 4, choose 1, x squared to the power 3 times negative 4y to the power 1. So notice how the powers on the x squared are going down as the powers on the negative 4y start going up and the value and the binomial coefficient is going to start going up as well. So 4 choose 2, x squared to the power 2 times negative 4y to the power 2. Okay, then 4 choose 3. x squared to the power 1, negative 4y, power 3, plus 4, choose 4, x squared to the power 0, 
negative 4y to the power 4. So that should be the complete expansion. So one term, two, three, four, and five. We always have one plus than the power of the original expression. So this is one way different than I've done it before. I've do it in steps, but here we can just write it all out and then simplify as we go. So four choose zero is going to be what? So perhaps you remember that anything choose zero is just one. So one times x to the power eight. Two times four, which are the exponents, you multiply them. And then anything to the power zero just becomes one. So one times x to the power eight plus four choose two is going to be six times x to the sixth power times negative four y plus four hmm, made a mistake. Four choose one is four. Four choose two is six x to the fourth <coughs> times and this would be 16 y squared plus 4 choose 3 will probably four times x squared times negative 64 y to the third plus 4 choose 4 is 1 x to the second power all of that to the power 0 becomes a 1 times 256 y to the fourth so just one more step and then I believe we have completed the whole expansion. <clears throat> so take a second to understand where things came from. So next, x to the eighth power minus. 16, 4 times 4 is 16, x to the 6 times y plus 16 times 6 is 96, x to the 4th, y to the 2nd minus 256. 4 times 64 is 256. Um, x squared, y to the third, plus 256, y to the fourth power. Okay, and that should be it. That should be the complete expansion for x squared minus 4, all of that to the fourth power. Okay, so pause it and take a second to go through the steps. Next, we'll do 2x plus 3 to the power of 4. And again, we're expanding this. So we have 4, choose 0. 2x to the power 4 
3 to the power 0 plus 4 choose 1 2x to the power 3 times 3 to the power 1 4 choose 2 2x to the power 2 3 to the power 2 as well uh, plus 4 choose 3 2x to the power 1 3 to the power 3 plus 4 choose 4 2x to the power 0 3 to the power 4 Okay, and next we're just going to simplify. Again, 4 choose 4 is 1, so 1 times 2 to the 4th, x to the 4th, so 2 to the 4th power is 16, x to the 4th, 3 to the 0 is just 1, so we don't have to write it. 4 choose 1, uh, we said it was 4. times 2 to the third power is 8 x to the third times 3 plus 4 choose 2 is 6 times 4 x squared times 9 plus 4 choose 3 is 1 times 2x times 3 to the power 3 is 27 plus 1 times 2 to the power 2x to the power 0 is just a 1 and then 3 to the power 4 81 okay so the last step will be to just simplify 14x to the power 4 plus um, 4 times 8 is 32 32 times 3 will be 96 plus let's maybe try to spread it out so I can write it right below the work 6 times 4 is 24 times 9 will be 216 x to the power 2 plus 4 times 2 is 8 8 times 27 again 216 times x plus 81 and that will be the expansion for 2x plus 3 to the power 4 next we are asked to find the first three terms in the binomial expansion uh, and we want to express it in a simplified form so we're only required to find the first three terms so start out with 8 choose 0 2x to the power 8 times 3y to the power 0 plus 8 choose 1 2x to the power 7 times 3y to the power 1 plus 8 choose 2 2x to the power 6 times 3y to the power 2 and that is three terms right this right here is 1 2 and 3 so those are the first three terms of the expansion of and how do we know that we know that because this are decreasing in order and that's how the formula goes right so we know that 8 choose 0 is simply 1 times 2 to the power 8 is 256 times x to the 8th power 
three y to the power zero is just a one. So we can leave that as it is. Then three, I'm sorry, eight, choose one is just eight times two to the power seven is 128 x to the seventh times three times y plus eight choose two is 28 and then two to the sixth power is 64 times x to the sixth times three squared which is nine and then y squared okay Next, 256, x to the eighth, plus, we have here to multiply 8 times 128 times 3, we get 3072, x to the seventh, y, and then plus 28 times 64, times 9 comes out to be 16,128 x to the 6 y squared. So that's the simplification for the first three terms of the binomial 2x plus 3y all to the power 8. Okay. Then we're asked to find the indicated term of the expansion. So remember, the first thing that we have to do perhaps would be to recall the formula for figuring out the specified value. So r minus 1 is equal to the term that we want or the term in question, right? So if we are looking for the ninth term, then that's what we will plug in for that. Okay, so, and I'm sorry, it is r plus 1. Okay, so this is 9. Therefore, r equals to 8. Okay, we're going to use the following n, choose r times a to the n minus r times b to the power r. So we have already found r and from the given problem this is our a and this is our b, right? So this whole thing is our b. So n is the power so 11 choose 8 times x to the power n minus r so 11 minus 8 times 2y to the power r which is 8 so let's figure out 11 choose 8 and it comes out to be 165 times x to the third power times 2 to the eighth power which is 256 and then y to the eighth power so next we have 165 times 256 come out to be 42,240 x to the third y to the eighth and that will be the ninth term of the expansion in x plus 2y to the power 11 okay hopefully that made some sense and if not um, please do go back through the steps and make sure that you understand them. Okay. Number 83. 
Uh, this is the princip the principle, the counting principle. I think that's what we call it. Fundamental counting principle. Sorry. So it's saying in how many ways can five volunteers be assigned to five different booths for a charity? So pretty much it's saying um, you have five spots, five booths, one, two, three, four, five, and then on the first choice you have all five people. So you have five choices. But once you select somebody for the first booth, you no longer have five, you have four left. Then once you select somebody for that, you have three left, and then two, and then one. Right? So five volunteers for five booths, it's equal to five factorial. So we get something like 120. So there are 120 different ways in where or in which we can assign people to five different booths. Okay. Next, a little bit more <clears throat> of the fundamental counting principle. Lisa has four skirts, ten blouses, and two jackets. So notice that there are three different categories. So how many three-piece outfits can she put together, assuming any piece goes with any other outfits? So all you have to do is multiply the different options, right? Four, because that's the first category. There are four options in this skirts category. Ten blouses. And then two jackets. So four times ten is forty. Times two is eighty. So Lisa has eighty possible outfits. Okay. Next, a student must choose one of four science electives one of seven social studies electives and one of eight language electives. How many possible core selections are there? So once again, this is the fundamental counting principle where you have four choices for science. So four for science, then you have social studies, And you have seven options and then you have language for eight options right so four times seven times eight will have 224 core selections that we can choose from if you pick one from each category there are 224 different ways to do it. That's what it says. Okay, so determine if the problem involves a permutation or a combination. Okay, so the matching section of an exam has five questions and eight possible answers. How many different ways can a student answer the five questions if none of the answer choices can be repeated? So <clears throat> keyword here is cannot be repeated, right? So combinations uh, don't care about order permutations do. So permutation okay so let's see number 89 a club elects a president, a vice president, and a secretary treasurer 
how many sets of officers are possible if there are eight members and any member can be elected to each position no person can hold more than one office so again we want to think um, what operation should we do and then carry it out so three different offices to be elected president vice president and treasurer out of eight people and so no person can hold more than one office so therefore we'll be carrying out a permutation and we have eight permute three or eight factorial over eight minus three factorial okay so comes out to be 336 different ways in which we can elect a president, a vice president, and a secretary treasurer. Okay. 90. From eight names on a ballot, a committee of three will be elected to attend political national convention. How many different committees are possible? So, since we don't talk about the order or if the first person gets a special treatment or anything like that, right? We're saying eight people and we're selecting three. It doesn't matter the order or anything like that. So we're going to do a combination. Okay, so eight choose three. So eight factorial over three factorial <coughs> times eight minus three factorial, which is equivalent to eight choose three. And we get 56 different ways to elect the committee members. Okay. Next, we're asked to find the given expression, right? To evaluate the given expression. And in this case, it says seven permute four. So simply put in a calculator or just use the formula, right? Which is seven factorial over seven minus four and all of that factorial. which is 840. Ninety-three. Use the formula for NCR or N choose R to evaluate the expression or use the formula. Nine factorial over five factorial times nine minus four factorial and that is equal to 9 factorial over 5 factorial times 5 factorial. Okay, so. Hmm. And we get something like 126 <clears throat> okay so simply just be able to figure out where these keys are and I believe they're right above on the Casio so above the multiplication and division symbol so one of them will be the permutation one of them will be the combination okay now Let's solve the following problem and be sure to distinguish between permutation and combination as necessary. In how many ways can Susan arrange 10 books into three slots? 
on her bookshelf. So how many different ways can we organize 10 books? So let's see. The idea is that you have 10 books. Once you pick one out, it cannot be replaced, right? It's a physical item. So, an order would matter, okay? So, book A, B, C, or that order, is not the same thing as organizing the books as CBA or something like that. So, we're doing 10 permute 3. Okay, so if we do that permutation, we will get 720 options in which we can arrange 10 books into three slots on the bookshelf. Okay, next. How many four letter codes can be formed using the letters A, B, C, D, and F? No letter can be used more than once. So that gives us the hint that we're using a permutation. Okay, so four. Actually, we have six to choose from. So six permute four. Right, because we're using six choices, A through F, so six permute four will give us 360 choices for password combinations. Okay. From ten names on the ballot, a committee of four will be elected to attend a political national convention how many different committees are possible so once again we're choosing from 10 so have we perhaps mentioned that order matters or not and the answer is no right we haven't said anything about the first person being awarded some kind of higher price or anything like that so therefore we're doing a combination 10 choose four comes out to be 210 different ways to do it now find the probability a bag contains two red marbles five blue marbles and eight green marbles what is the probability of choosing a blue marble when one marble is drawn so that was um, pretty much the, I can't remember which one of the two probabilities, but you're trying to figure out the probability of the event, and then you're just saying the probability of getting a blue, right? Well, number of blues over number of marbles. Okay, so. How many blues are there? There are five blue marbles out of a total of 15. So, that is the probability, one third or 33.3% chance of drawing a blue marble. Okay. Two sided, two six sided die are rolled. What is the probability the sum of the two numbers on the die will be six? So <clears throat> think about the sample space for the probability of the die, right? So we have the combination of all the different possibilities. So what is the probability that they will all add, 
add up to 6. So 4, 2, 5, 1, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1, 5. And that's it. I believe there's only 5 different combinations that will give us 6. So if we look at the Let's see. The sample space for the sum of the die. So the event is that we get a sum of six, right? So Okay, so we have how many times does the sum of 6 happen over the total number of outcomes? So 5 out of 36, and we could probably simplify that uh, into a decimal if needed. So. But not really. We can leave it as a fraction. Either way, so 5 over 36 <clears throat> is the solution, or 0 0.1389. Okay. Next, what is the probability that a car drawn from a deck of 52 cards is not a 3? So, probability of not a 3. is equal to 1 minus the probability of getting a 3 from a deck of cards. So for the exam, there will be a formula sheet that's available and also it has a deck of cards for your convenience. So this is equal to 1 minus, well, what is the probability of getting a 3? So there are four threes out of the 52. So 1 minus. 1 out of 13, and so 13 over 13 over 1 over 13, so we'll get 12 over 13 will be the probability that you do not get a 3. So remember, the probability of something not happening is equal to 1 minus the probability of it actually happening, okay? Next, a bag contains 21 marbles, of which 4 are blue and 7 are green. One marble is drawn from the bag. What is the probability that the marble drawn is not blue? So, again, probability of not blue is equal to 1 minus the probability of getting a blue marble. So, 1 minus... 4 out of 21, right? That's however many there are total, 21, and then 4 are blue. Simple from there, turn that 1 into a 21 over 21 so that it can have the same denominator. And we have 21 minus 4 will be 17 over 21. So 17 over 21 will be the probability of drawing not a blue marble or drawing something that is not blue. Okay. Next, a card is drawn from a deck of 52 cards. What is the probability that it is a 3 or a spade? Okay. So, Try to remember those or probabilities, right? One thing or the other is not very 
how do you say strong right when you're talking about or you could stick with one thing or the other right it doesn't matter which one you get so probability of a or b is defined as the probability of a plus the probability of b so we're looking for the probability of getting a three or a spade well that's equal to the probability of getting a three plus the probability of getting a spade so probability of getting a three is equals to what well there are four cards with the face or value three on them so four out of 52 and then how many spades are there <clears throat> and there are 13 of them out of 52 now stop hold on one second are those events mutually exclusive meaning can you have a three that is not a spade and the answer is no so I forgot to mention so minus in the definition where they're both or where there is a intersection between the two so minus what is the probability that it is both a three and a spade well there's a one out of 13 probability right because there is one three that is a spade so one out of 13 well actually one out of the 52 sorry so from there we simplify 4 plus 13 minus 1 all over 52 so try to think a little before you begin the problem and say can these two events happen at once can they be exclusive or like can they be mutually exclusive or not right a three happens to be a spade so therefore they are not mutually exclusive okay so we get here 16 out of 52 uh, does it simplify a little? And the answer is yes, we get something like 4 out of 13. So the probability that you draw a card from a deck and it's a 3 or a spade is 4 out of 13. Okay. Next, a card is drawn from a deck of 52 cards. What is the probability? that it is a picture card, jack, queen, or king, or a spade. Once again, think, can a picture card be a spade? And the answer is yes, right? So they are not mutually exclusive. So probability of A, which is face card, or a spade, is going to be the probability of a face plus probability of a spade minus the probability that it is both <clears throat> so what is the probability of getting a face card well there are four suits and three faces for each so 12 out of 52 plus how many spades are there 13 out of 52 now what is the probability that it is both both a face and then a spade it'll be 3 out of the 52 right there are three face spade cards out of the 52 card deck so 12 plus 13 minus 3 all of that over 52 so that becomes 
12 plus 10, 22 over 52. And we simplify that to 11 over 26. So that is the probability of getting a picture card or a spade. An urn has balls numbered 1 through 7. So urn A has balls 1 through 7. Arm B has balls 1 through 4. What is the probability that a 4 is drawn from A followed by a 2 from urn and B? Well, this is saying probability of one and the other, right? But notice how it is very specified that they are in separate urns, okay? So the probability of one does not affect the other, so they're independent events. So you got, you're looking at the probability of A and B, and since they are independent, P of A times P of B, right? So probability of getting a, what was it, a four, and the probability of getting a 2. Well, it's probability of getting a 4 times the probability of getting a 2. So, a 4, we have a chance of 1 out of 7 times a 1 out of 4. So, 1 over 28. So, the probability that we get a 4 from the first container and then a, s a number 2 from the second container is 1 out of 28. Okay? A game spinner has regions that are number 1 through 9. If the spinner is used twice, what is the probability that the first number is a 3? And the second number is a 7. <clears throat> so understand the problem and think that if you spin the earth, uh, the, what is it, the spinner once, the second time, all the numbers are going to be there, all the probabilities are going to be there. So the two events are independent of each other. So we're looking for the probability of getting a 3 and a 7 in succession. Right? So you're thinking these two events have to happen back to back. So do understand that the probability of things happening in some kind of prescribed order is very small. It's very difficult to predict many sequences of events in a row. That's why the probability is often very small. So how do we get a 3? There is a 1 out of 9 probability. There are 9 spots, nine regions. How can we get a seven? Well, one out of nine, right? There's only one spot for seven out of nine. When we multiply this, we get one out of 81. And that is the probability that the first time you spin, you get a three and the second you get an 81. Okay, so <clears throat> we have some additional problems, and this one comes from unit test 4, and it says, state if the following functions have inverses that are also functions. So, pretty much, do they pass the horizontal line test? <clears throat> so, if you draw a horizontal line test through here, well, it passes. Uh, this one is hard to see, but the answer is yes. It doesn't touch the graph, and the graph is right here. Uh, this next one is kind of hard to see, but it touches at two different places. So A was yes, this was yes, 
this was a no, it doesn't pass, or it doesn't have an inverse. Here, this guy touches once, so yes, it has an inverse. This one right here definitely does not pass, so no, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, and no, it doesn't have an inverse. Next. <clears throat> Um, question that might have come from test 5 uh, for some people. The information is at build decays in the body exponentially and its half-life is 2 hours. Find k, the delay rate or the decay rate and round to 4 decimal places. Well, if you remember from previously, we'll just get to it. A K has a solution or the formula for it. It's ln of A over A sub 0 divided by T. Well, if we're explicitly talking about the half life of it, K is equal to ln of 1 half over whatever the half life is. In this case, it's 2 hours. So plug that into the calculator. And we get something like negative zero point three four, and then we have to round to four decimal places, so sixty six negative zero point three four six six. Then part B, we're asked to figure out. Uh, use the k value to determine how long in hours it will take for a dose of Advil to decay to 10%. So, how long will it take for 10% of the amount to be there? So, here we switch to the other formula. Which is this. t is equal to ln of a over a sub 0. All of that divided by k. So, remember. A is the final amount, and we're looking for 10% of the initial. So 10% times A sub 0 equals to A. Plug that in to the given formula. So T is equal to ln of 0 0.10 A sub 0 all over A sub 0 divided by the K value that we found on the previous part. So T will then be ln of 0 0.10 divided by negative 0 0.3466. So let's see. Okay. And we get something about 6.3. 6, 4 hours. So that's how long it takes for the dose of Advil to decay to 10%. After 6 hours, there will only be 10% of however much Advil you took. Okay. Next, uh, expand the following logarithm and simplify or evaluate it as much as possible. So notice that there's a division symbol, so we're going to split it over that. So log of 2 square root of z minus log base 2 of 16. So next we'll say log base 2 of z to the 1 half power minus, we can simplify log base 2 of 16 because it says 2 to the what power gives me 16 or simply put in a calculator and you'll get 4. So next bring down the power to the front so we have 1 half log base 2 of z minus 4. That would be as much as you can simplify that. Okay. And that's it.